Okay, Tuesday, Thursday class, I am alive. I do apologize for having to cancel class this morning, which I don't do lightly. The good thing, as I mentioned in my email last night, is that reading off of charts, which we're going to start in just a minute, are really fairly easy. Oops. And we're going to learn how to read a Z chart today. That's fairly easy. On Thursday, we're going to do word problems, and as we're doing the word problems, we'll get even more practice of reading off of that Z chart. So if for some reason I confuse you in the video at the last half of this video, you'll have more practice on Thursday. Okay, so this is finishing up our probability handout eight. So after you watch this video, you should be able to do handout eight, number two, three, and six. Um, again, the nice thing, remember, from watching the video is if I talk too fast or whatever, you can easily back up the video to rewatch something. Um, if you look back in your notes when we were doing our rules, we had the multiplication rule. And it said the probability of A and B. That's the intersection. This is going to be nice because when we... Uh, get to our charts in just a minute, we're actually going to be able to see that intersection on the chart. Now, when we were doing our word problems, we knew that the intersection equaled the probability of A times the probability of B if they were independent. So in this topic of reading off of a chart, we're actually going to check that formula. And if that formula holds, if it's equal, then we'll call the two things independent. If the formula doesn't hold, if it's unequal, then we'll call it dependent. So we're kind of using the formula in a backwards way. Here's a chart. Um, you have it printed in front of you, but it's also from the book if you want to see sort of the neater version of it, page 214, uh, number 11.34. I'm not doing the problems that the book asked. I've made up my own problems. I'm just using their nice data set. Now, one thing about the chart in the book, they made your life easier. They went ahead and totaled the rows and they totaled the columns and they got the grand total. I do know on my handout eight, I do not think that I totaled the rows and the columns, so you'll need to do that first before you ever start answering questions. So let's just practice a few. See, these are categorical variables. I'm assuming you looked in the book to see what this is. So if you didn't, we were breaking up gender to male and female and then the highest degree that the person earned. Bachelors, masters, some type of professional degree, and then your doctorate or your PhD. Um, yes, if you got your doctorate, you probably did get your master's and your bachelor's, but if you got your doctorate, you just put yourself in this column. So we don't have, you know, repeats. Somebody didn't put themselves in two or three different columns. So let's say we say the probability a person is female. We just want to come all the way across and look at the total number of females I have, 1481, divided by the grand total, 2506. I'm leaving this in fraction form, so that way you could see where I got the numbers. You know, it's nice to show me the fraction, then go ahead and get the decimal also. So that one's fairly easy. How about probability a person has a master's or a doctorate? So we got two different things happening here. This is sort of our, pretty much our um, addition rule. But there is no intersection. Masters and doctorate, you either have one or the other. So I'm just going to add up the two. Let's see, masters, I have 671. Doctorate, I have 59. So I said 671 plus 59 divided by the grand total. Again, you can go ahead and uh, calculate that out to see what the decimal is. But look at this one and really compare number two to number three. Number three says a person has a masters or is female. Now we're going to have an intersection of those two. So again, really on the numerator of this fraction, I'm using the addition rule. I have my total masters people, 671, and I have my total females, 1481. But if you look, if I add up my masters, and then I come across on the females, like if you take your pencil like I'm lightly doing, you're going to see that you double counted the 411. So that's why I'm subtracting off the 411. I'm subtracting off the intersection of female and masters. Because I double counted those 411 people. Again, divided by the grand total. You can put that all in to get your decimal. <clears throat> For those who can see that they probably could have done number three visually in a different way, that is fine also. You know, we needed masters or female. You may have added up all the females. Okay, and you would have gotten the 1481. And when you came to add up your masters, you may have realized, wait, I don't need that 411. I just need to add 260. 
okay, my kitten's going to get in here. Um, and that would have been fine to do too. You should have come up with the exact same answer. I'm going to turn the page now. I do believe I, uh, there's a number four to this problem. Okay. So, number four. That, that says is. That is not a number 15. We're going to ask you about two of the values of those categorical variables, and we're going to ask you if they're independent. It's not going to be a generic question just like, is gender and degree independent? It's going to be specific parts. So I asked, is being female and having your doctorate independent? So using that multiplication rule, I don't like A's and B's, so I try to use words that I can understand. Probability of female and doctorate. We're trying to see if it does equal the probability of female times the probability of doctorate. Okay, um, These two on the right are probably the easier ones. Probability of female, I think we did that in part one, so that's just part one's fraction. Doctorate, if you go back to your chart and look at the bottom under doctorate, you'll see the 59. If you go ahead and multiply those two numbers, you will get 0 0.0139. Now, female and doctorate, that is the intersection. We are literally going to view that right off the chart. So I'm going to put the chart back up really quick. We're looking for female and doctorate. Okay, so in our chart here, I need you to be female and I need you to have your doctorate. So there's only 32 of those. That's the intersection. We can see it right off the chart. So that's why I put 32 over the 2506. Working both decimals, you see that those decimals are not equal. Thus, being female and having your doctorate are dependent because it's not equal. Now, just a little ramble about this because this is what I expect you to do on a test and this is how I'm teaching it right now. I just kind of want to let you know it's not real life. A few years ago, I tried to teach more the real life way, but I think it confused students more because this is the way your book teaches it. If it's equal, we call it independent. If it's not equal, we call it dependent. But look at these numbers. We have like 1.4% and like 1.3%. I'm not convinced that that 0.1% is really enough of a difference in real life. The very last week of the semester, we will be, do, we will be doing the hypothesis test called chi-squared. If you're a psych major, bio major, and a few others, you will be using chi-squared a lot in your studies. But we always have to kind of squeeze it in at the end because we don't have time. But anyway, this very fancy hypothesis test is actually sensitive enough to run the numbers to see, is that enough of a difference? Or is that difference we're seeing just due to a little bit of random variability? Because um, we see in real life, with real data, we would never end up with equality. So basically that means we're always going to have dependency and that's not right. So in real life we know that our number is going to be a little bit different. We just got to figure out if that difference we're seeing is big enough or not. Okay, so I just want to let you know this is a nice intro to it, but we're definitely going to be coming back to these types of problems and doing them, um, you know, much uh, <clears throat> much more formal at the end of the semester. But for right now, so we're all on the same page. If it's not equal, we call it dependent. If it's equal, we call it independent. Okay, um, so very easy because when the numbers are on the chart, it's really easy to pull them off of. Again, go to handout eight, practice those three problems, check your answers on Canvas. If you have any questions, you can come by my office hours. So we're gonna sort of switch gears now. So this ended the probability topic. Now we're gonna start into a very special distribution that we have called the normal distribution. Let me get that up, that's page three, I think. Okay, so chapter three. Well, we've seen this little curve before. This is supposed to be perfectly unimodal and symmetric. I didn't do a very good job drawing that. Um, sometimes people will call unimodal and symmetric bell-shaped. Some people call this the bell-shaped curve. Some people call it the normal curve. Um, it is a continuous distribution, means we can have every possible decimal. Um, you know, there are a lot of distributions that probably look like this, but the very special one is called the normal distribution. So we're going to be looking to find areas under curves. Remember area under curve is the same thing as probability. But if you kind of just drop two lines there, 
you can see that it's really hard to try to figure out, let me draw that a little bit darker, if we were looking for this area, that would be really hard to figure out. It's not a geometric shape. While probably the most of it is a rectangle, I could probably squeeze a few triangles in there, anything I do from geometry is just going to be an estimate. And we don't want estimate. We want precision. So this is a very nice, precise mathematical model. Okay, well, the problem is I can't find the areas for it, though, since it's a curve at the top. So just to let you know, we're not going to go, you know, of course, too much into it, but that's what calculus does for us. It doesn't matter if you've had calculus, but calculus concepts, um, if you've had calculus, you should remember it's the integral that um, calculates area under curves. So calculus helps us calculate that area. Um, well, we are not doing calculus in Math 220, though, so just to stick it up here so you'll know what I'm talking about, we're going to have this chart. See how there's a big Z at the top? I'm always going to call this the Z chart. All of this, all these numbers in here, those are areas, okay? So that Z chart I just showed you are the results of calculus. Someone, you know, through formulas, mathematics, has already run the formulas to calculate the areas and they've put them in a chart for us. So that's all the rest of this video really is going to be about as to how to read that Z chart so we can get the areas. This is one time that I go very old school. I am always going to get my areas off of that Z chart. I feel like from looking at the pictures at the top and that type of thing that it really reinforces what we're doing. If you've had AP stats and you know how to get the normal probabilities, the normal um, areas off your calculator, that is fine. You can do it. I'm not going to teach it to the class though. Okay. Now, we've got a couple things happening. There are lots of examples, I mean probably infinite, in real life that fit the normal curve. Adult female heights would probably be normally distributed, I don't know, maybe mean 65 inches. Adult male heights would be normally distributed, maybe mean 68, 69 inches. I know there's a cork problem we're going to do. Maybe corks have a mean of a half inch. Um, my ketchup bottles always talk about smaller ketchup bottle would have a mean of 16 ounces, maybe a larger one a mean of 28 ounces. I didn't give you a whole ton of, of charts. I didn't give you a chart for ketchup bottles. I didn't give you a chart for adult female heights, another chart for adult male heights. I only gave you this one chart. So that's why there's a nice old Z at the top, okay? So each real life scenario has its own mean and standard deviation. I'm reminding you of the notation now. We introduced this when we did the empirical. That means is normal, the mean comes before the comma, standard deviation comes after the comma, okay? But somehow we're going to have to take all of these real life scenarios, my corks, my ketchup bottles, my heights, and we're going to have to standardize them, okay? And if you remember that from test one, standardize means Z. Our Z score was called a standardized score. So those Z scores, how we calculate Z's are back from test one, okay? So if you got them wrong on test one, make sure you review that. So again, I've given you one chart, okay, and the chart I've given you we call the Z chart. It's also called the standard normal chart. It's called the standardized chart, whatever. And just to let you know, well, it's centered at zero and has standard deviation of one. This is really like the empirical rule that we had used earlier, okay, but this model is much more precise. So on Thursday, we're going to learn how to convert our real problems, our heights, our ketchup bottles, our corks, into z-scores, and then we're going to use the chart to get the probability. So you're going to always see me put a little flow chart like this on the board. This is just representing there's always two steps to a complete problem. We're going to start on Thursday. We're going to do this part, the real word problem. But we're going to have to convert the real data into z-scores, then we will be able to use our chart to get area or probability. Those two words are completely interchangeable. I will usually use an A here, stands for area. It is a synonym for probability. I guess you could say a synonym for proportion. It's all the same thing. How we go from X to Z's is that same formula we used on test one. How we go from Z to A is from using the chart that we're gonna practice in just a minute. Now we can go forwards 
through this process or we're going to have times that we go completely backwards. It's just important to understand you can't go straight from your word problem to getting an area. You have to go through the Z and then of course backwards too. So they're always two-step problems. Um, but the rest of this video is really going to be just focusing on how to go from Z to A and A to Z. While I turn the page, I'll ramble a little bit. I always view this as a metaphor for uh, I would love to learn how to build things with wood. And if anybody was ever going to teach me, we're probably not going to go by the real wood and the directions on how to make a bookcase. Someone's probably going to take some scrap lumber and let me practice sawing it and whatever else I have to do to it until I get good at it. Then we're going to get the good wood and we're actually going to build something. But at the beginning, I'm just going to learn how to use my tools. That's all we're doing on the rest of this video. We're going to learn how to use our tool. Our tool here is the Z chart. Okay, so make sure you have that in front of you. Hold on a minute. Okay, a few other little random notes. Very unlike handout eight probability which just came off of Jeannie and her chores and all those. Um, the word at least or the word more than was very different. We cared whether you included a certain point or not. Okay, very different. Well now since the normal distribution is a continuous curve where every possible decimal is possible. We really don't care. So I'm just trying to rep make sure you know that less than or equal to some number is going to be the same thing as less than a number. Okay, we're not going to get worried on whether we have to include that exact number or not. Um, the way I usually explain this to students in class is a little metaphor again. Um, you know, technically there's an infinite number of decimals. Um, let's say you go to Myrtle Beach. It surely seems like there's an infinite number of grains of sand. There's not. It's a finite number, but it, it seems infinite, right? So imagine going to Myrtle Beach, picking up exactly one grain of sand and bringing it back to Virginia. No one's going to miss that grain of sand, right? It was one out of so many that nobody's going to miss it. So we can kind of think about it like here. You know, whether I'm leaving out exactly, say, the number two, who really cares? I included 1.9999 and 1.99 and 1.99999. I included every other possible decimal except for precisely 2.000. That would be like that one grain of sand. Really, it's not going to make a difference. Now, the chart that I'm going to put up here in a few minutes, whenever, because, you know, you might have another math class or biology class or something that gives you a Z chart. You always want to look at the top. That is absolutely critical so you'll know which way it's giving you the areas. See how the chart has shaded to the left? The chart is giving you less than areas. It's really important to always look at the top. There are some charts that give you greater than areas. I won't be using those. This is my favorite chart I use. So the chart we use, the chart, this is the exact chart you're going to be given on your tests and your exams, give you less than areas. Okay, so that's really important to understand. We're going to do some problems though. Maybe they'll ask us about greater than. Well, remember, the entire curve is worth 1, which represents 100%, the unit whole. So if we have to do a greater than problem, then we're going to end up subtracting it from 1, very similar to the complement rule we just came off of from probability. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so let's first start practicing. If I give you a Z value, how do you get the area? How do you get the probability? Now again, right now we are just practicing the mechanics of using the chart. We're really not going to get probably the entire feel for this topic until we do the real word problems on Thursday. <clears throat> Alright, so let's start off. Let's see, we're going to do Z less than 1.97. Okay, so Z less than 1.97. I'm really not going to zoom this in so you can see it because you have one in front of you, but I'll point to the general area. So first of all, understand all these four digit numbers, okay, all these four digit numbers in here, the body of the chart, they are my areas, they are my probabilities. Now around the frame of the chart, okay, if you look really close right there, it says Z star, I don't care about the star, those are Z values. Coming along this way are the negatives the ones place and the tenths place 
across the top, the top of the frame, is the hundredths spot. So you can actually look up z-scores to the hundredths spot. Now over here are the z-values that are greater than the mean, which would be positive z-values. So here are the positives. Again, the ones place in the tenths place, across the top, the hundredths spot. <clears throat> So the problem we just asked for was 1.97. So you want to find 1.9. Trying to look to see if you can see. So 1.9. Get the seventh in the hundredth spot, 1.9. You should see 0 0.9756. 0 0.9756. Okay. It is a less than problem. That's the way my chart reads. That's my answer. Okay. How about this one? I'm trying to pick some that sometimes students look up the wrong thing. Z greater than negative 0.04. <clears throat> All right. Um, negative 0.04 is what we have to look up. Negative 0.04. Make sure you don't look up negative 0.4. Negative 0.04. So here's my negative 0.0 and 4 in the hundredth spot right here. 0 0.4840. Okay. 0 0.4840. But remember this asks me greater than. My chart just gave me the less than area, but I need the greater than area. So I've got to subtract it from 1. So that's why my final answer is 0 0.5160. <coughs> okay. Here's some oddball ones coming up. Z greater than 5. Again, if we're in the class, you wouldn't be seeing the answer. I'd tell you to try to go find 5. You're not going to be able to find 5. 5 is off of the chart. Now, off of the chart does not mean that you can't answer the question, okay? If you want to be able to use the chart, you can look up the biggest number you can possibly look up. Look up 3.89, not 3.8. It does, the chart does go to 3.89. If you look up 3.89, you will see 1. You'll see 1.0000, 000, right? Now, though, it was a greater than problem. So I have to subtract that from 1. So 1 minus 1 would be 0. Now that sort of makes sense. Um, let me grab a piece of paper to make sure we understand that. I want to show you how you could probably do this visually and not even have to use the chart. Okay. So look, we were doing z greater than 5, right? Okay. This is not one of your printouts. I just drew this. All right, 5, you do have to know that 5's way up here because 3.89 is pretty much, quote unquote, the end of the chart, at least to the limitation of my Z chart you have, which is four decimal places. So 5 would be up here. And they were asking you greater than. Well, look, it's like there's nothing left there. I don't even have anywhere to draw. So yeah, 0%. Okay. So usually, if you know you are off the chart, your answer is either going to be 0% or 100%. And a quick little picture, drop your 5 and think, well, greater than, wait, does that look like I'm shading 100% or does that look like I'm shading 0%? 0%, I have nowhere to shade, I have nowhere to draw. Okay. We'll look at this next one. Z less than negative 4.3. That's a negative in there. Okay. It's not on the chart. You could look up negative 3.89. When you look that up, you will get... 0. 0.0000, okay, which approximately zero to four decimal places. And we were doing less than, so that would be our answer. So that's kind of easier. Let me show you my chart again. Okay, so like negative 4.3 is down here, but since I was going less than, I have nowhere to go, right? So that's why it's zero. Now, let me add a little piece right here. Okay, if I had asked z greater than negative 4.3, without going to the chart, I could do this visually. Okay, I'm at negative 4.3, but if I want greater, I'd be shading the whole thing. And I can visually see that would be 100%, 1 or 100%, either form that you want. So when you're off the chart, you should be able to figure out if the answer is going to be 0 or 100%. So those are kind of oddball ones. All right, we have the last case. It's what I call stuck in between. 
where let's say they ask for a z value that's in between two numbers. So right here, I'm going to try to convince you of a rule that I'm going to tell you. Okay, we're coming at it visually. So let's say I need it to be between a and b. Okay. Well, if I look up A on the chart, it's given me that entire area. If I look up B on the chart, it's given me that entire area. What could I do to those two areas to get what's in the middle? I could subtract them, right? And that would cancel all that. So I would be left with what's in the middle. So whenever we have a stuck in between problem, we don't have to split it up. This is what you're going to do. You're going to look up A on your chart, get the area for that, minus you're going to look up B on the chart and get the area for that, and you're going to subtract them. Okay, we'll practice that on the next page. Okay, so up at the top, this might be something you, you know, read the problem, kind of try to go do on your own, and then look, you know, pause the video and look back to see if you got the right answer. We are stuck between negative 2.03 and 1. Okay, now we are not subtracting the z-scores. We are not saying like 1 minus minus 2.03, 3.03, and look that up. We're going to look up 1. When you go look up 1 on your z-chart, try that now, remember you're looking up 1.00. I didn't have a tenth and a hundredth spot. You should see 0.8413. Okay, now I'm going to go look up negative 2.03. So do that. Go look up negative 2.03. Make sure you don't look up negative 2.3. 2.03, negative. You should see 0.0212. Subtract them. Our final answer is 0.8201. Okay, so that's how we're going to do stuck in betweens. All right, so that we just practice, if you're given z values, how to get areas. I call that going forwards. Well, now we're going to practice what I call going backwards. If you're given area, how do you get the z value? Okay. So, let's start with number one. What values make up the smallest 2%? Now, until we have a real life word problem, I don't really know where small is, okay? It's always gonna be, you know, the context of the word problem. But for right now, I am gonna assume that small is on the left, okay? So, I just kinda colored in a little piece. I labeled the area above it, 2% in decimal form is 0.02. And what I'm really doing is trying to figure out what's the z value for that boundary, okay? What z value that if I looked it up would give me 0.02? So this is where some students get confused. It takes a few times to get the hang of it. My area is 0.02. That is not a z value. Let me show you. We are not looking up 0.02 and saying 0.5080. We are not doing that. This is an area, okay? I'm always going to stay very organized and label it as an A. Students that I see get this wrong, they just kind of have a 0.02 floating on their paper. So then they think it's a z-score. It's not. It's an area. If you want, anytime you have an area, you might want to go ahead and make it four decimal places that way, visually, it kind of catches your eye, and you're like, yeah, wait a minute. If we were in class, you would see me literally waving to you right now, because I'm trying to tell you that you have to search through all of these numbers for 0 0.02, or 0 0.0200, or as close to that as you can get, okay? Now, it looks a little daunting at first. First of all, hey, look, we're on the left-hand side, so I know my z-value's gotta be negative, right? So I know I just eliminated the positive z's. I am somewhere in here. At first it looks like it's kind of like a needle in a haystack, but it's really not because there is patterns, rhyme and reasons to the numbers. The bigger areas are down here, tiny areas are up here, of course. Be careful, don't look up 0 0.002, don't look up 0.2, we're trying to look up 0.02, okay? Pure coincidence. This is not the correct number that's circled, but at least it, it caught my eye, so I know I'm close. That's 0.0207, okay? Now, always check each neighbor to see if you can get better. Well, 0.0212 got worse. Let me check this neighbor. 0.0202, oh, that's even better, okay? So now I'm at 0.0202. Well, I'm gonna check this neighbor. 0.0197, and he's a little bit farther away, so I'm gonna go with 0.0202. That's the area 
that is as close to 0.02 as I can find. Now you just got to see what the z value is. Come across, you'll see negative 2.05 negative 2.05. Make sure you don't write that as negative 2.005. That extra zero in the hundredth spot was just a placeholder. Our z-scores are two decimals. So when you go to get that hundredth spot, make sure you put them in the hundredth spot, okay? So again, if I lost you there, kind of back up the video, watch that one more time. All right, negative 2.05. So, you know, do it backwards. Look up negative 2.05. You'll see an area pretty close to 0.02. All right, how about what areas, <clears throat> I'm sorry, what values make up the largest 5%? Now, you will notice I really started drawing pictures here. I probably should have drawn pictures on the other page, but just to make this video a little bit easier, I didn't. But here it is so critical to draw yourself a picture. I took the time to do that. Again, I'm going to assume large is up here on the right, 0.05, okay? Now it's so important to remind yourself, wait, my chart does not give me areas that go to the right. Because look, if you forget, look at the top of your chart. It gives you areas that go to the left. That doesn't match that guy, right? So I cannot look up 0.05. I have to search for how much area is going to the left. That's why there's that 0.95 down there. So the area I'm really searching for is 0.95. There's a couple of other sort of checks and balances so you don't make the silly mistake. This picture, again, why I'm a fan of the pictures, reminds me I better come up with a positive Z value. I can tell I'm above the mean. I should have a positive Z value. If you had go gone and looked up 0.05, you would have had a negative z value, and we don't want that. So, got to look for the area to the left, which is 0.95. So my A that I'm looking for is 0.95. Pause the video, see if you can go fi find 0.95 in the body of the chart, in all those four-digit numbers. You are not looking up a z-score of 0.95. This is an area. Okay. Well, if you did that, you probably would have seen two numbers that were really close. You would have seen 0.9495 and 0.9505. Let me pull up the chart and show you. All right. If you're looking for 0.95, you would have found 0.9495, but then 0.9505. How do I pick? They're both equally as close to 0.95 as possible. My 0.95 falls right in the middle. Okay. 0.9495 relates to 1.64 for the z value. 0.9505 relates to 1.65. So that is why I went right down the middle. I knew I was between 1.64 and 1.65. If you just stick a 5 in the thousand spot on the smaller number, you will have the z value that falls directly between 1.64 and 1.65, and it's 1.645. Um, this is probably the second most famous number in statistics. You'll see this number come up when we do confidence intervals probably in about another month. Okay. Well, how about the last case, but going backwards, that sort of stuck in between one. What values separate the middle 95% from the most extreme 5%? Okay, now extreme does not necessarily mean high. It doesn't necessarily mean low. It means away from the middle. Well, I have two places that are away from the middle. I have my low numbers and I have my high numbers. So basically I put 95% in the middle and I split my 5%. 2.5% on the right, the extreme right, and then 2.5% on the extreme left. 2.5% um, is 0 0.025 in decimal form, okay? Due to symmetry of this curve, I do know that whatever z value I come up here, it's going to be negative. The exact same z value is going to be here and it's going to be positive. So I really only have, you know, one problem to do. It's much easier to do the left tail since that one is shaded to the left. This tail matches how my chart works. So I'm going to go look for 0 0.025, okay? You will find this one precisely. So again, pause the video. Go look for 0 0.025 in the body of the chart. 
hopefully you found z of negative 1.96. Okay, you should have gotten the z value of negative 1.96. So I know this boundary is a z of negative 1.96 and due to symmetry, since these tails have the same area in them, I know my z scores are going to be the same, just one's going to be negative, one's going to be positive. So I know that guy's positive 1.96. So basically you have plus and minus 1.96 as the answers to that. Okay. I think that's it. So again, you may, if, if I've lost you on this chart, kind of rewind the video, watch it again. Um, Nice thing on Thursday, we're going to have real world problems, we're going to have that extra step to do, but then we're going to end up with problems just like what I did on this video today, so we will be practicing this part again. I'm not going to assign any homework for this stuff. Um, basically, tonight and tomorrow, you should become an expert on handout 8, the probability, um, and all linear regression. If you're stuck on any of that, come to office hours tomorrow, Wednesday. So then that way, Thursday night, you can become an expert on handout nine, the new stuff. And then if you have questions on that, um, you can come to office hours Friday. Next Tuesday, uh, a week from today, we'll be reviewing. Usually students need to review probability. That's what I find, but we'll see. Whatever y'all want. And then next Thursday before spring break is your test. All right. All right. That is all. I will see you guys on Thursday.